Hey guys, we got a great show tonight. We're going to scratch the surface of Gobekli Tepe, and we're going to dive deep into the Fall River Cult, a story in eastern Massachusetts that will make you very sad and will hopefully inspire you to do great things. Hi, this is Ed Locke with USA Mortgage. Buying your first home can be overwhelming, but here are five tips to make the process go smoother. Number one, find a lender, me, Ed Locke, that can answer any questions you might have and help you get pre-approved. There are multiple options available based on your situation. Number two, work with a real estate agent you can trust. Number three, don't rush the process. Take your time and know that the process could take some time. Number four, consider all the costs. Number five, get a home inspection and review it with your realtor. Keep these tips in mind, budget for yourself, and you'll be that much closer to making your dream of homeownership a reality. So reach out to me at 502-680-0953. NMLS ID 448-908, DAS Acquisition Company, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, NMLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is an equal housing opportunity. scoured the podcast world and finally found us newsworthy with steve and jerry where we delve into all things mysterious macabre or out of this world and decide if they are truly newsworthy two words and two question marks My man. Hello, Mr. Steve. How are you doing? I'm excellent. That is good to hear. Excellent. 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 Had it a good is. week, I hope. Huh? I hope you had a good week. Dude, it's so hot outside. Yes, it is. <laughs> that it is. Hopefully the last week, but man, it's going out with a bang. Gosh. Tara, I've projected out 99, I think. Yeah. Here in Kentucky, Miserable. we have, and in the deep south, we have uh, what they call the heat index. It's when they combine the heat and the humidity. And that temperature is going to be somewhere around 105 tomorrow. Yeah. That is stupid. But you know what makes the day great? What is that? I, unlike you, am enjoying a cold, sweet red. There you go. That always helps. And tonight's Cold Sweet Red is by Beach Haven Vineyards and Winery. That's located in Clarksville, Tennessee. This is Governor's Red, and it is a blend of grape and blueberry wines. Go figure. Delicious. Now, uh, my father-in-law, Mike, and his wife, Joni, a couple of weeks ago, took us to uh, Beach Haven for a tasting. And, man, that place was awesome. The tasting was great. The people there knew what they were doing and talking about and let us try, like, five, six, seven, eight wines. We didn't like it. They poured out and give us another one. Oh, very nice. um, So good kudos out to them. If you're in Clarksville, Tennessee, go see Beach Haven Winery. Um, I think we left. We brought nine bottles back with us. (laughs) They did impress you. Yeah, it was good. Now, the Governor's Red is my second favorite. Last week I had the Golden Rose. By far my favorite. Delicious. It's won multiple awards and it's right up our alley. I know you can't have any cold sweet red. Yeah, but unfortunately not. Very delicious. I'm stoked to have this. Also, it is way above the limit we're accustomed to when it comes to percentage. So if I get a little slushy, we'll blame it on Mike. Who, by the way, Celebrating a birthday today. Well, happy birthday, Miss Mr. Mike. Yeah, we, we like Mike. Mike's an old non-guest, I guess we could call him. Yep. He's we've 
He's one of the few that spread our podcast far and wide Literally. for us when he first started. He's a pilot Literally. for a major flew around airline. The world. <laughs> and he flew us all over the place he, listening to our podcast. quote, unquote, borrowed Delta airplanes to fly to countries all over the globe just so he could land and listen to us and let us add yet another country <laughs> to the list of countries that we had listeners from. So once again, thank you, Mr. Mike. When we first started this, and a little backstory for our new listeners, when we first started doing a podcast, we had no idea how this was going to go. We thought, you know, hey, we get five, ten listeners, we'll be in good shape, yeah. right? Um, and then this weird thing happened. Did you hear that? I did. It was weird. Uh, this weird thing happened. We started getting listeners from all over the country. Yeah. And the world. And then it started all over the world, and we would cover, and one of our first few episodes, if you go back and listen, we're talking about how excited, hey, we had a new listener in Zimbabwe or wherever. I remember the week when, other than Kentucky, the second, we would normally talk about the states where we had the most sure, listeners sure. in. We live in Kentucky. Kentucky was normally, as it should be, yeah. our number one state. But one week, Kentucky was still number one, and it's not a state, but if it had been, it would have been number two, was right. Slovenia, Slovakia. Slovakia. We still have a big following in Slovakia. And we have no idea who. We <laughs> wish they would get in touch with us and let us know who's <laughs> listening to us from Slovakia. It's but, just, it's, yeah, it's, blew us away. It's so bizarre. It really is. When we first started, where we were so excited about, hey, we had 25 new downloads, as we, and, and now we look at that and we're like, oh. <laughs> you know, it's, it's. I'm still absolutely blown away when yeah. I look at the countries that we've got listeners at for the last and seven days, thirty days. Consistent it blows me away. You know that that listen to us every day. So yep. if you're one of those people, we thank, thank you, you very so very much. much. You make this worth doing. To be honest. Um. So, Jerry. Yes. The real estate market now, due to some health issues here recently. I've had to take a little step back. Um, you're still trying to work with Ed and still trying to make some deals, but I've had to take some step. I got some health issues, so I had to take a step back away from real estate for a while. But it appears that the interest rate's going to come down a little bit, and it's trending that way, which means the market should start firing back up anytime soon. That would be nice. Yeah, I just thought that'd I'd be very that. Nice. At least, Speaking of that. At least here. Yeah, that'd be very nice. I don't know. Did I tell you about my uh, new house? No, you yeah. got a new house I without did. me? I'm sorry, bud. Huh? Yeah, moved into my new igloo the other day. <laughs> Friends threw me a housewarming party. Now, I'm homeless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Otherwise, laughing at you in this case, because that's what you get for not having a good realtor like me to get you in a house and not a realtor. Normally, or, you love those housewarming parties, but not in this case. Well, in this case, if you bought an igloo, it's going to melt anyway. It's 100 degrees outside. <laughs> <laughs> Could have picked a better week for that joke, right? Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, I said I had some health issues, but there's something else I've been really struggling with. What's that? You know, I've been struggling with my sexuality. You have? Yeah, a little bit. What do you, what, what, what do you call it when you're attracted to men and women? Uh, but neither are attracted to you. Well, I'm not for sure. <laughs> By yourself. Oh, <laughs> very apt description for that, I would think. <laughs> By yourself. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't care what anybody chooses to do. You do you, boo. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You do you. Yeah, absolutely. It's not my place to judge. It's my place to love and to and to spread some words. That's it, my man. You do you. Absolutely agree. So, as we continue, I'm really, really loving our new format. So do I. The new topics. We're hoping we got a sound quality issue. We're aware of it. We're trying to fix it. It is only in the main body of our podcast. It has been. But we're not one to shirk away from, hey, we, we're we making, there's something wrong. We, we like to, you know, we're the first to admit it. We're trying to fix that very hard. And as soon as we do, we've got some great guests lined up. Um, that we do. But you had mentioned to me, and you're 100% right, before we switched um, formats and, and things, we had 
guaranteed we had told a, a potential guest that we wanted them on the show. And even tried to make it happen a time or two. And, and did a, wasn't able to do it because yeah. of technology at our old publisher. Podbean's problems, yeah. Um, so I really want to take a step and go back, and we're going to make that happen just as soon as we figure out the sound quality issue. Um, because everything else is really good, and I think we may have a solution. Fingers we crossed. Um, if this works great, if not, we'll send an email to Lisbon and and, and Lipson and, and try to get this fixed for you guys. Um, but we're, we just we just like being on front of our problems. We know that there's a sound. It sounds everything sounds great. You get to the main body and the main gist of our podcast, and it sounds like we're talking in a tin can. And it does. That's that's just Which trash. Makes zero sense. It's not a hardware issue. The, all it's the not. other parts of it. We which, went we with went. a new host to record it separately. I know that's not something you guys it, need to know or care about, but the hardware works perfect for everything else yeah. except this one portion. So, yeah. so we get that narrowed down and we're good to go. We're going to get it fixed. We're going to get it right. And we're going to get uh, into some of our awesome guests. We have some really cool stuff lined up for you guys in the very that near future. Do. So really excited about that. Tonight we've got um, two really either one of these could be a whole show easily um and probably we probably should have split them both up to be honest but one of them is so macabre and so <sighs> dark dark it's really very is. very dark and it makes you just really sad to be human in some respects um very true uh, so we're going to cover that. That's going to be what we end on. We're going to scratch the surface of Gobekli Tepe today, tonight. Now, I say scratch the surface because basically scratching the surface is all we've done to this site. It was only discovered in the mid-90s. Um, and it's huge due to sonar readings, and it's massive. And we're going to get into a couple of, just a, a brief rundown of the facts, some theories, what some people are thinking that this is, was, when it was, because the when it was is beyond belief. It's pretty amazing. So uh, we're going to get into that, scratch the surface on that. We'll probably revisit that at some point, to be honest, because I really want to spend tonight, a lot a lot of time tonight in, into yours. Um, what do you think? Think that's good? Absolutely. And you're talking about each one of these could have been a full show. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure multiple books have been written on the please, I'm sure I'm gonna massacre this, but go Beckley take That's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. Uh, I'm sure multiple books have been written and the multiple books probably only scratch the surface. Absolutely. That's how big this is. Absolutely. And all of that is pure speculation. Do we want to go ahead and get into it? Sure. All right. So the reason it's all pure speculation is because we've only uncovered about 3% of Gobekli Tepe as far as excavating it at this point. You know why? Why is that? Not because it's one of those things that over time, time has erased it from. That happens, right? Sure. Many cases. In Gobekli Tepe's case... Most experts, and everything's speculative on this, we just found this place in the mid-90s, okay, discovered it and started excavating it. But most experts on this subject believe that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't lost to time. It was buried by its creators. <laughs> so it was intentionally hidden from the world. <laughs> Uh, Do you have any idea why, or is that, am I jumping the gun? Is that oh, like you're way jumping show? the gun. They're, they have no, there's so much about this, they have no reason. They don't know what it is. They don't know if it's religious. They don't know if by some of the markings and the carvings on these columns, these huge obelisks, um, if it was religious or if it was astrological, if it was... Um, and we're going to get into one of the more interesting theories is that it was a place designed to memorialize a huge cataclysmic event. Now, the event that we're going to talk about is something that is covered in every religion in the world. Um, 
but this even gets into the story as to why and how and um it does show that our civilizations go let me just ask you a question sure. in thousands of years how old um how many thousands of years old do you think stonehenge is um five Five thousand. It's between five and eight thousand years old, and at the time we thought that that was probably one of the oldest temples created by man. Um, that's a long time. It's very simple. You know, we stack some stones, which they still don't know how those stones were stacked mm -hmm. or how they were carried to Stonehenge. Um, Gobekli Tepe predates Stonehenge by almost four to 6,000 years. Jeez. Now, they don't know. There's so many of the things they don't know. They don't know if the sonar shows that they don't believe that this was a permanent living site. According to all the experts, during the time that this place was built, humans were still very nomadic. They were chasing the herds. Um but this particular site, which is in the southeastern part of Turkey, and in Turkey, there are many, many, many of these types. Of, whoa, sorry about that. I'm a, I'm a hand stalker. Sorry. <laughs> um, many, many of these sites, but none of them nowhere near on the scale of Gobekli, Bo, Gobekli Tepe. Sorry. Um, it's hard for Kentucky boy to say that. That's yep. probably a reason we not, we don't, we're not public speakers on a on a course that, that teaches this stuff. <laughs> but I know here's I would a, be the last one picked huh? for that. So I know I would be the last one. Oh no, you you Jerry, your voice is no. so butter smooth compared to mine. No, I could no. see you being like a radio I DJ. I can't pronounce it, Jack. Well you just did. The problem is I grew <laughs> up uh, reading a lot. I was a huge reader. And there's so many words to this day that I mispronounce because I have no idea how to pronounce them. I've only encountered them in books, and books don't tell you how to pronounce the words. So, well, that's true. But now we have Google, and how many times have we used that tonight? <laughs> we wouldn't have gotten to this point of pronouncing Gobekli Tepe had it not been for the Internet. So, in about 1995, Klaus Schmidt actually... Um, discovered, if you will, and I'm using air quotes, go back like Tepe. Um, farmer saw a couple of rocks sticking up out of his soil, didn't know what they were, called called around, Klaus came and seen and said, oh boy, we got something big here. Um, now this is dated all the way back. <laughs> so the numbers here are a little crazy, okay? So it dates back to 9,600 to 8,800 BCE. Um, that is, for oh, the faint at heart, the pre-pottery Neolithic age. So it's before... 10 to 11,000 years ago. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, you're right. Almost almost 12,000 years ago. And um, at, and by being pre... <laughs> pre-pottery age we didn't even know how to how to store food at this time so we hunt we kill we eat we hunt we kill we eat repeat rinse repeat every day we gather a few berries we eat every day that's you don't do that you don't eat you die <laughs> i wonder had they not figured out smoking meat things like that at all i mean i i don't know was it back there without a time machine how do you know you know all what right. i mean um Good you point. would hope that, that they, somebody would have dropped a, a chicken leg on, on a fire at that point and said, this tastes better. And then, you know, if we can invent A1 sauce during the Civil War, maybe we can invent barbecue sauce in the pre-pottery pre age. <laughs> what was that again? Pre-pottery monolithic? Or yeah, something? it's called officially called the pre-pottery Neolithic, Neolithic. B gotcha. era. Yeah. Um, now you'd have to be a rocket, uh, not uh, it, you'd have to be Indiana Jones's lost brother to figure that out. I'm not him, so we won't, <laughs> we're not just gonna stay in there. But here's some weird things I'm just gonna cover some bullet points. Like I say, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I really want to get to your topic, but here's some bullet points and some things we're gonna delve into at a later time. Um, 
hardcore because there's a lot of stuff in here. So there's one of these T, um, I want to say it's a, a column. It's a pillar, but they're all inscribed. Now, some of these look like a 12th grader did it, okay? You know, it's a it's a very basic-shaped animal, and some of them are like Van Gogh did them. Intricately carved, gorgeous. Like, even by today's standards, you're like, how the hell did you do that? We didn't have pottery back then. We, yeah. sh- we sure didn't have tools, right? Right. They were doing this with a stone and just to bashing the rock. Chisel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the things that they were able to put on the back, one of them is called the vulture, uh, column. Okay. On the back of the vulture column, it looks like they have carved what we would consider a comet event that, what is that called? It, it shows the comet coming into the atmosphere, breaking apart making it snow, putting us into an ice age. And there is a word for the ice age that it brings us into. And folks, I do apologize. I can't say the word and I, it is escaping me at the moment, but um, it is the era in which that ice, according to whoever built this site became the great flood. <laughs> And wiped out all, you know, most of Americans. Or most, <laughs> most Americans. <laughs> it wiped out most of everything. Um, a lot of people show, and due to how it's laid out, it, it, it's, it's a big enough complex that people could have survived in this complex whilst that was going on. Now, that's one theory. All of this is speculation. All of its theory. However, there's a couple things about it that are really neat. You ever heard of Easter Island? Sure. Easter Island is on the far side of the world from this. Oh, really? However, on the back of the Moai, the statues, Mm -hmm. which are not just heads, okay? They are full bodies, and the bodies have been covered up to the head. But on the back of the bodies, the architecture, the drawing, are almost identical to the oh, ones you. on Gobekli Tepe. Isn't that insane? And it wasn't like the artist could have hopped on a, the first Delta airplane <laughs> couldn't, to couldn't go to the, the other side Mike of the world. Mike couldn't have flew them over there, right? Yeah, right. Even Mike couldn't do this. <laughs> Mike can do a lot of wonderful things, but that's yeah, not one of them. You know, and how weird is that? And like I say, I'm just hitting bullet points. There is so much going on here. In Australia, there are cliffs. And on these cliffs, there are also carvings. There are, are, are statues. There are things that also has this type of writing that's very similar to what's found at Gobekli Tepe. So in our next episode about this, we're going to dig into all that because it's cool. And the people that are most associated with those carvings, those drawings, are the Aborigines in Australia that are the ancestors of the current Aborigines. How neat is that? Very but we'll get so. into all that. Um, it's just, I would encourage everyone to find Google. Go to Mr. Google. And just Google some of the pictures of some of these carvings. Again, some of them are very simplistic, very what you would imagine would be in that era. And then some of them are intricate. They have they tell stories. They line up stars. You know, the, the big argument is, do these pictures represent real animals or do they represent, obviously they represent animals, but do they represent what they were seeing in the stars? Because the the planet Cirrus, according to our science, would have just became visible in our night sky during this age. So was this whole Mm. place built because a new bright star, it's the brightest thing other than the moon in our solar system most of the time. Is that why they built this? In homage to that star? And are, are these things just 
built for that? I mean, there's so many questions. It's all speculative. That we'll probably never know. That we, Unless we develop a time machine, you're right. We'll probably never know the answer. But it does lead to a few things that I think that are pretty what I would call against the grain. Okay. The first thing is that the science we know about the, the age of humanity that we know now is probably wrong. There has been multiple reports that even in Egypt, there are missing civilizations. Those missing civilizations, there's a lot of reports that said that the the pyramids were built by a generation that we don't have any record of, and that the current Egyptians that came and began and got credit for the pyramids um, actually didn't build them. They were already built. Um but there leads with the age of Gobekli Tepe, Gobekli Tepe um, shows that our great civilizations predate what we thought. Our ability to learn and to grow and to develop things pushes back another 12,000 years. You know, that there was another civilization. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a comet. Maybe it was the flood. Every religion in the entire world has a, a mention of a great flood. The Quran, the Holy Bible, Buddha, every single one mentions a great flood. This predates the great flood. So that lends me to believe that there were great civilizations here prior to that. I'm just saying. So I can't wait to get into this um, at some point, and we will. It certainly needs more. Yeah, and, and we like I said, research. we we took the surface, and we took a very little needle, and we finally scratched just a little bit of it. Um, but I think that it's going to need it's going to need its own show at some point, very very soon. Oh, one other little interesting fact you may find interesting, you may not. Of all of the sculptures, of all the pictures where sex was indicated on any of these, on any of the pillars, on any of the products, and anything that was produced at Gobekli Tepe, all of them were very predominantly male. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but it's it's noticeable enough that everybody notices and, and mentions that. So there you go. <laughs> Go figure. Go figure. So anyway. Extremely interesting. So many questions. Hundreds of questions. Hundreds. Like, I, I, I don't even know where to begin with the question. This is totally away from something you've talked about, but when you were, I looked into it a little bit. Here's a question. Archaeologists have long associated the appearance of these settlements with the Neolithic Revolution which is a transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. But there is huge disagreement on whether the adoption of farming caused people to settle down or did settling down cause people to adopt farming. Now, just that. Yeah, just that alone. Here's another thing that we didn't even touch on. What's that? Every human picture in this was missing their head. Go figure. In, in, and they were found fragment so far of at least two different skulls that had been um, honed down and, and, and made into something other than a skull. Huh. In Turkey, back during this time, it was very uh, the, the head, there was a very big anti skull religion and I'm using air quotes here where skulls were kept as treasures Skulls, if you, your loved one died, you kept their skull and put it in your house. So every picture of a human or a human-shaped object in Gobekli Tepe is missing their head. Just another thing that makes you say, hmm, or in your case, what the hell? <laughs> exactly. For all of everything yeah. you just mentioned, what yeah. the hell? <laughs> what the hell were these people thinking? Better yeah. yet, what the hell drugs were these people on? And, and it gets back to the old question, the same question you and I have a lot in, in when we talk about these ancient civilizations and the, and the stuff that they built. These pillars were not just honed out of the dirt that was there. They were picked up, 
they were moved here and then sat up. And some of these weigh like up to 30 tons. We're talking about people that couldn't make pottery. <laughs> yep. Are able to but move. they knew this. They knew yeah. how to do this. Yeah. Insane. Insane. So many questions that we will probably never have the answer to a lot of them. Well, I didn't mean to take all the time. But I, I just wanted to throw a bunch of information out there. I wanted to get your all's juices excited because we're going to cover that again in a few weeks. I think that's a it great topic. It. Yeah, absolutely. It does deserve it. So let's like a t- let's take a really hard turn left and let's get into the 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 cult that you have dug up today that you want to talk about. The Fall River Cult. It originally started off as the Fall River Murders. There's a small town in southwestern Massachusetts called, believe it or not, Fall River. (gasps) And uh, (laughs) over a period of a year or two, there were three young ladies that were murdered. And originally it was just, you know, the Fall River Murders. But as evidence began to come in that more and more pointed to the fact that these murders were performed by satanic cult members, it quickly became the Fall River Cult. I mentioned that there were three young ladies, and they were. The oldest one was 20 years old. And uh, the first one was Doreen Levesque. The second one, Barbara Raposa. And the last one was Karen Marsden. The first one, as I said, was Doreen Levesque. She was a 17-year-old. And that murder was committed they believe, in the night of October 13, 1979. And her body was found the following morning under the bleachers of the Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School, and her wrist had been bound with fishing line. She had been horribly beaten. She had been sexually assaulted. Her face and skull had been crushed by a large rock that was found nearby. Ugh. She was beaten so badly that her body was only identified after police sketch artist put a sketch drawing of her in the local paper. Couldn't use a picture. Far too horrific. Wow. Uh, they didn't even weren't even able to identify her. Um, they originally suspected that one of her clients had done this. I think I've. I've when I was talking about the three women, I, I meant to mention and forgot. All three of these young ladies had a history of sex work. All three of these ladies had a history of drug use. Uh, again, all three were young. There was a 17-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 20-year-old. Gosh. So when Folks they first love your daughters. Yeah, Don't let them yeah, get that absolutely. life. Uh, yeah, they, they first thought that she, that one of her clients had done it. Now, no one was ever convicted in her murder, the Doreen Levesque. And sadly, part of the reason, probably a big part of the reason, is that she was a runaway from foster care. So she had no close family. Uh, If you do, you don't end up in foster care. Right. If you have close, loving family, it doesn't get to that point. She was raised in foster care, and apparently that was so bad that as a 16-year-old, she ran away and was being a prostitute on the streets of Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, My heart breaks for this young lady, and that's all she was, was a young lady. She was someone's daughter, had a chance, had a good life. I'm sure she had hopes, she had dreams, she had goals and aspirations, but none of that Came to fruition. No, she met the bad side of somebody's... Ugh. She died with a skull that had been bashed in, horribly beaten and sexually abused. Mm. And no one really cared. To this day, no one's ever been convicted of the crime. A couple of people were charged, and that uh, charges were eventually dropped. I, I gotta believe a big part of it is because she had no one on her side. She had no one rooting for her. She had no one calling the police and saying, hey, you know, I need some updates on this case. What's going on? Just a young lady that the world had chewed up and spit out and forgot about. Truly so sad. Now, originally, the first murder of hers was thought to be a one-off. But less than a year later, the body of another sex worker was found on a, quote, unquote, makeshift altar. 
Ooh. The murder of 19-year-old Barbara Raposa was committed on November the 7th of 79. But her body wasn't actually discovered until January 26th of 1980, the following year. Like Doreen, her body was also tied up, her skull crushed, and she had been sexually assaulted. Her 43-year-old boyfriend, you're right, 43-year-old boyfriend, again, she was 19 years old, but her 43-year-old boyfriend, That's Andy Matthias, say what? That's your age. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> you you saw that age come and go several years ago. Well, no, I mean, if you're 43, I'm 10 years younger than you, exactly. so that makes me 33. So I like it, you being 43. But her 43-year-old boyfriend reported her missing the following day. So her body, you know, she, again, was, uh, her murder, murder was committed, they believe, on November the 7th. Body wasn't found until January 26th. But the following day after she was missing, her boyfriend reported her missing. And later on, so did her grandmother. But Andy had more evidence than just the fact that she was missing. He told police that he and his girlfriend, Barbara, had been in a satanic cult and that he knew of two women also in the cult that he suspected of being involved. He claimed that Robin Murphy and Karen Marsden were the guilty parties. A few days later, Multias went back to the police and he claimed that he had had a psychic dream. And in this incredibly vivid, incredibly accurate vivid or psychic dream. He knew where the body was located. He knew the position that it was in. He knew the time of death. And he described several other pieces of evidence that had never been made more public, that had never been made public at all. He was subsequently charged with her murder. When the police did question Karen Marsden, she again was one of the two women that he had originally said that he believed was involved, she claimed that her pimp named Carl Drew, and fellow sex worker Robin Murphy, who was also in the, in the uh, cult and was also Marsden's girlfriend, along with Maltias, were responsible for the murders. And she said that Drew and Murphy were part of a devil worship and prostitution ring. She said that they would perform rituals and human sacrifices deep in the forest. And she was also worried that she was going to be the next victim because that she was cooperating and even talking to the authorities. She was worried that they were going to kill her next. Later, on February 8, 1980, the police picked Karen up. They were now at the point in their investigation where they were starting to take her claims more serious. And they wanted her to show them where the rituals were being performed. Well, at this point, she was scared to death. She was in a panic. She did not everything she had previously said. She said none of it was true. She would made it all up and demanded that they drop her off. She said, if my pimp finds out I'm even talking to you, I'm dead. They did. They dropped her off in front of a local church. She was never again seen alive. Why? She was never again seen alive. If you tell the police that if I'm cooperating with you, my pimp is going to kill me, why are you not immediately offered some sort of protective, protective they, they custody? Did. They did. She refused it all. She, at oh, this point, gotcha. she wanted nothing to do with gotcha. it. Gotcha. She okay. did not want to be seen. She wanted that. They picked her up and intended to take her to the police station. They quickly figured out this girl's not telling us anything. Uh, if we ever hope to use her as a witness and get her to calm down a little bit, let's Give her what she wants now. She's not going to tell us anything today. It cost so her they her did life. drop her off, and she, yeah, was never seen alive wow. again. Um, but yeah, she she told him that her pimp, Carl Drew, who she said referred to himself and insisted that other people in the cult call him Satan. Mm. He referred to himself as Satan, insisted that other people call him as Satan. She so, said he was going to kill her. Here's the thing. What's that? Satan, by all accounts I've ever saw and ever read, Satan presents himself as the most handsome yeah. human ever oh, made. This guy didn't. I'm looking at a picture of Carl Drew. Yeah. <laughs> if that's the most handsome human ever created, mm, wow. No. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Again, I said she was never seen alive. Her body was found a couple months later. Well, I'm sorry, not her body. Her toothless skull, a few bone fragments, and a few loose teeth were found. Her body has never been recovered. Wow. 
At trial, Robin described that after she and Carl Drew killed Karen, they decapitated her and cult members used her head as a soccer ball. <gasps> they kicked it around. They didn't have a ball, so they used her head as a soccer ball. Holy buckets. Carl Drew. Then he was a 24-year-old pimp. And again, he was the pimp of all three victims and the satanic cult leader who referred to himself as Satan. He was found guilty of Marsden's murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole, and he is still, in fact, behind bars. Robin Murphy, who was then 17 years old, again, just another young lady. She was deeply involved in all three of these murders. She was a 17-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. But she was sentenced to life for second-degree murder of Marsden. Again, she was also Marsden's lover, and then she also admitted to being involved in her murder. She claimed that she was hit by Carl Drew and some of the others in the cult in a satanic ritual where they killed and sacrificed Karen to the devil. Now, Karen, as I said, pled guilty to second-degree murder. Her charges were reduced in exchange for her testimony against Carl Drew and Andy Matthias. She was paroled in 2004. She was sent back for a violation in 2011. She had parole hearings in 2017 and 2022 and has been denied both times. So this girl got out in 2004, screwed up. And remember when I said she, in 2011, she went back in for a parole violation? Her violation was she had started an affair with a convicted felon and didn't tell her parole officer. I had no idea something like that would get you sent back to prison. This girl went back to prison in 2011 and is still there 12 years later. Uh, Andy Mathias, another one of the, the members of the cult, and again, he was uh, Raposa's boyfriend. He was found guilty of her murder. He died in prison in 1998 after having served 17 years. And again, we mentioned earlier, no one has ever been convicted of Doreen Levesque's murder. Jeez. Now, Fall River, Massachusetts was known to be a tough area in the 70s. And this happened during what was called the Satanic Panic of the late 70s and early 80s. And that was when parents and law enforcement became convinced that women and children were being preyed upon by devil worshippers and the woods were being used as scenes of animal sacrifices and evil rituals. And a lot of this came from movies. Yes. Oh, no, no. I was just thinking, you know. Oh. Um, a lot of this came from movies. But in this case, it absolutely wasn't. This, this, All of those things had actually happened. Uh, even with Fall River being a tough town, these murders still stood out at the time of, because of the savagery. Again, Levesque and Raposa were both tied up, brutally assaulted, sexually and physically. Their skulls had been crushed with rocks. There was evidence that both bodies had been tortured before being killed. Now, believe it or not, with everything I've said, I left out several of the most horrific details of their abuse. You know, somewhere along the line, once you pass a certain point, it's just gore. Uh, yeah. Now, yes. these, these people, do you think that this guy, Carl Drew, truly believed he was Satan, or was he using no. that as a... It was a way to keep his harem in line. Yeah. Hey, he probably had some... From what I've read, several of them, including Robin Murphy, she got started in the occult beliefs and worship when she was 11 years old. Wow. Uh, you know, and, and Robin Murphy was in the center of this. She was involved, some people say, one of the lead detectives said even more so than Carl Drew. He wow. thought she was the real ringleader. Huh. Even so, she was 17 when it happened. It also turns out, when she was 11 years old, she was being raped by Andy Matthias. She went to the police when she was 12 years old. They wouldn't even take her report. Oh, my God. They said she was a 12-year-old who could not be believed. So as a 12-year-old kid, you're being raped. You go to the police, and they won't even bother to take your report. I, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I know these, these girls had all done bad things. Sure. They're prostitutes, they're drug users. But when you stop and take a little bit look deeper, when you look at their past, the one girl 
raised in foster care and had to run away from that. You know, I, I fully believe that life is far more about how you play the hand you're dealt. Absolutely. But even so, somewhere along the line, when you look at the horrible hands that life has dealt some people, it's hard for me to help but think of the phrase there, but for the grace of God, go out. Listen, as someone who uh, did and cared for multiple foster kids, there is a point when you talk to them that there's a, a very definitive switch when they're just saying things that they know will upset you to when they when you they let you in. And if you're a person who has been, and I'm going to say the word, if they've been willing and trust you enough to let you in, right. you damn sure better listen to what they're saying. Yep. Because there's, they, I, I, they, they have been through so much. They have put so many walls up. And these kids, they're 17. They're still a kid. Absolutely. Doing sex work, doing drugs. If they let you in to say, if they've gotten to the point to say, you know, okay, I know I've done all this, but I didn't consent to this. That should perk the curiosity. That should throw up sure. the red flags. That should do the damn thing. Absolutely. Um, these kids don't open up to just anybody. Even if that young lady had survived and and had a wonderful life, she would never trust the police again, ever. Oh, absolutely. Anybody, anybody in a uniform, she would have never trusted them again. Absolutely. It's terrible. It is. Guys, if you want to find out more about this story, Epix come out with a four-episode miniseries entitled Fall River in May of 2021. You can watch that on the Roku channel. It's also on Amazon Prime Video. Um. Uh, <laughs> I got the, I did most of my research on a handful of sites, Wikipedia. You ever heard of Murderpedia? No. There's a site called Murderpedia. I do look at Wikipedia because I'm a nerd. <laughs> Wikipedia, Murderpedia, Crime Door. Also, there is a couple of young ladies that has a podcast series entitled uh, True Crime New England. And their website is truecrimene.com. Um uh, I highly recommend it if you're into the true crime type stuff. And they had information that I gleaned from them as well. So thanks to them. A truly sad story. It, it's disgusting and horrible and all that. But to me, the, the biggest thing I walked away with was these three women were, as we said, very young. They were all in the sex industry. They were all drug users. And it's almost as if they were just chewed up and spit out and forgotten by the world. How many, how many serial killers, how many cults target that particular group? Because they're weak. Nobody no. cares. Not, Nobody's going to miss them. It's so sad. It is. And as, so. as, you know, this really tugs at me because as someone who is a huge proponent of foster care, as someone who's been there, done that, done it, or done the damn thing, if you will. Um, those kids have had a such tough time in life to begin with. And then they just, you know, you, I can't, when people often ask me, well, why do you do it? Why do you do foster care? And my answer was simple. I'm not trying to show them how to um, do anything, but to show them what a, you know, my life's a wreck. OK, you know, I, I struggle to pay bills like everybody else. Um, I have bad days. I have a beverage now and then, you know. But that's and I'm using air quotes normal. Sure. These kids have never even attained a, a sense of what is normal. Their normal is something that a normal person can't even wrap their head around. There's a reason. You know, you walk, look on Facebook and you look on Instagram or, or whatever website you want to look at, and you'll see 
unbelievable. You will just keep looking. You'll see it. The parent on there that says, well, CPS took my kids for no reason. That simply does not, not happen. happen. Yep. I've been around it too much from my own personal life to the reason I got custody of all of my children. CPS does not want in your life. They've got in Kentucky, and, and folks, if you live in Kentucky and you have any interest in foster care, please do it. When I, you know, we had a very specific plan when we decided to foster. We were going to foster until my youngest son graduated, because when he graduated, it would be the first time in my adult life I've not had a child. I've not raised a child. Um, when we stopped fostering a little over a year and a half ago, there were over 9,000 children that needed a good home. Yep. Now, fentanyl, heroin, crack, uh, meth, these are the main drivers of that. You know, parents get on that shit, and they just, they just, they care about nothing else. They care That's about right. their next fix. Um. These kids have no normal. Yep. And even if you think your life is broken, if you think that your life is messed up, if you've got a job and you go to work and you're paying your bills, these kids need you. They need you to show them what normal can be. And, you know, we did older teenage boys because that's what we had. We couldn't do girls. Didn't want girls in the house with our teenage boys. We made good decisions. And we like we we we're a very active family, so we couldn't do babies. We no thank you. I don't want any more diapers. Ask my kids, they want me to watch my grandkids. I'm like, yeah, I'll watch them and scissor out of diapers. Done with diapers. But so we did a specific group. But those kids had no understanding of what normal is. I'll give you a good example, and I know we're cutting time. I know we're blasting through time. But Jerry. We were sitting here, me and one of my foster kids at the time, were playing Xbox, okay? We were playing a game, I don't remember, Fortnite, whatever, and the Xbox stopped working. Red Ring of Death. Yep. And they're like, oh. They're like, they were just broken. Started crying. They're like, I'm like, dude, what's wrong? He's like, when, when are we ever going to get that fixed? I'm like, dude, we're going to Walmart right now and buying a new Xbox. The hell? We're not doing it without an Xbox. And he's like, really? And when we got up and we went to the Walmart, we bought a new Xbox. We brought it home, plugged it up, and he was blown away that in a normal house, you have the ability to replace something that breaks. These kids have no idea what a loving, nurturing family environment is. Right. None. And it doesn't even involve money. It just, no. you know, the one rule that has always been in my house, you can ask my kids, any of my children, is we have dinner at the table, no technology together, period. Yeah. We talk about our day. We talk about, you know, whatever is on everybody's mind. If there's a issue that's coming up that we have to deal with, we talk about it at dinner. I can't tell you how many kids that came into my home and was just that became their favorite time of the day. Yeah. Just because they got to interact they got to spend real quality time they didn't and because someone cared enough about them to just to ask, ask them how their healthy how their day, day was. was yeah so Sad, but just that little thing. you know and i know this is off topic of of the cult, kind of but, but you know it fits the one girl if, only if, one of the girls but one of the girls was raised in foster care and her foster care was so bad as many cases it is you hear about this a lot hers was so bad that she decided that running away living on the streets being a drug addicted prostitute was better than that. And you know, that to me tells me we have one in all the foster kids we ever done. And I won't mention names because I think he listens to our episode some. But and I love this kid. He, I say kid, he's a grown man now. And he's getting it. He's getting it done. I can't be more proud of him. Um the only one we couldn't take care of was him because he was fighting such a mental battle with some really bad demons. But you know what? It was our responsibility at that point to say... To get him help. To get him help. Yep. Hey, dude, 
we love you, but we can't provide what, what you, you need. need. So yeah. we're going to get you to somebody who can. And there you go. This lady didn't have that. It was so bad. She felt like running away was the best. We never had a kid. And even away. when she got there, even when she was in the middle of the hog pit, doing drugs and and prostitution, it was still better because she could have went back. She's yeah. 17. She could have went back. Crazy. Chose not to. Yeah, crazy. And that was the sad part for me. It's yeah. horrible what happened. I'm not meaning yeah, to no. demean that by any means, but just the fact that these young ladies thought they... The world had given up on them and didn't care. And that was the sad and part. The, the, the real sad part is, Jerry, they were right. Oh, yeah. And it was proof that they sure. were right because we did The didn't one when she was 12 years old and went to the police and tried to report right. <laughs> right. They wouldn't even take her report. Well, man, what do you think? Gobekli Tepe needs more news coverage? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think both of these absolutely need more so coverage. so exciting. That one, there's just so many questions, so much that we can hopefully learn. And, you know, there's always going to be a lot of questions. Hopefully we can answer a few of them. Ramona and Eddie are putting in their two cents worth. They're at our feet right now, and they're tooth fighting. <laughs> so that moaning is not me being excited. <laughs> that is Ramona and Eddie over That's here not one of wrestling your around. Elderly co-workers. <laughs> Can I tell that story real quick? I think you have to. After that. <laughs> okay, so real quick. I know he's getting ready to end the show. Real quick. Um, I saw a meme that said, you know, it showed a dude rubbing a lamp and the genie comes out and he says, you get three wishes. No, you get three wishes and there's three rules. No, no, uh, uh, more wishes, no love and no bringing somebody back from the dead. And the guy sits there and he thinks for a minute and he says, okay, I've got it. I wish that every time you lick an envelope, it moans. And the genie looks at him, and he got a quizzical look on his face. And he says, okay, there's four rules. <laughs> so I told that to some of the ladies. I work with uh, some elderly ladies at work. I told that, and now every time you'll be sitting there, and it'll be quiet, and every once in a while you'll hear a, ah, <laughs> from somewhere in the office. <laughs> One of the elderly ladies. Let's oh, know. man, I love it. I love where I work. I work at a place that really means something to a lot of people. There you go. It's a very fulfilling job. I'm never going to get rich there. Um, I work there full time. I do real estate, um, and I love it. But anyway, both of these items, thumbs up. They both need Absolutely. more and more, more coverage. coverage. We need to figure out who Absolutely. killed these folks and put them in prison for a long time. Um, One. Yeah. Two of the three have people convicted. Yeah, we need, to find, we need to find the last person. Yep. Absolutely. It, man, that episode is really interesting. And if you'll stick around for us for just a few commercials, we have another great story to tell you. Hi, this is Ed Locke with USA Mortgage. When it comes to buying a home, the process can be overwhelming and confusing. With so many options, it can be hard to know where to start. That's why it's important to work with a certified mortgage loan originator. I have the knowledge and expertise to guide you through the process and find the best mortgage option for you. I will work with you every step of the way to ensure that you are getting the best deal possible. So if you're looking to purchase or refinance, please reach out to me at 502-680-0953. So don't take on the stress of buying a home alone. Work with me and I will make your dream a reality. Trust the professionals and make your home buying experience a positive one. MLS ID 448908, DAS Acquisition Company, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, MLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is equal housing opportunity. If you want us to review or rate your product on air, if you have suggestions for new episodes, awesome ghost stories, or anything else, please reach out to us. Our email address is newsworthy with Steve and Jerry at gmail.com. Our text number is area code 540-709-1318. And now, back to the story. Hey, Jerry, tonight's weird bonus story is the ghost of the coal mines. You know okay. what I'm talking about? I do not. Ah, we're talking about the Conigans. They were deprived of experiencing sunlight 
fresh air, or clean water. Instead, they lived in darkness, underground, relying on their instincts and the guidance of their human partners. These horses <laughs> were born, worked, and perished in the dark, enduring strenuous labor. In fact, it was not uncommon for a single horse to pull up to eight heavy coal wagons alone. Despite their challenging circumstances, these animals were stupid smart. They were very aware of themselves. They were aware of their capabilities. If they tried to hook up nine wagons, the horse wouldn't move. You'd just look at them funny. They, they knew what time it was to get off work. They worked a very specific 10-hour shift at the end of 10 hours. They would take the wagons and everything and go right back to the stables. <laughs> um, and um, they would also look out for their human partners, whom they developed, I guess, air quotes here, very close friendships with. Now, this they even used them all the way up to 1972 when what happens to everything, technology took over. Yep. Um, in fact, on December 3rd, 1972, Ruby, the last miner's horse, uh, actually got to emerge from the mines, and the company went all out. They had an orchestra there. They put Ruby with a flower reef like they do with the Kentucky Derby winners. Mm -hmm. um, and she was brought out of the darkness, symbolizing the conclusion of an era of the mining horses and the Conigan partners. Uh, to commemorate this, their shared labor underground, there was a sculpt sculptural <laughs> uh, composition named Conigan, uh, and it was erected on the Museum Reserve Red Hill. So, uh, if you ever get a second to read about these horses, if you like horses, I'm not a horse fan, but that's pretty amazing. And thank goodness at least one of them got out to see the fresh air. And with that, have a great night. And Jerry, if you can't see the light, be the light.